Good afternoon. Welcome to Midday Live from our studios at Adesawe, Kanda and Accra. I'm Steve Denti. Remember that the Midday Live is streaming on Facebook and on 3news.com. You can also catch us on your DSTV channel 279. Our headlines this afternoon, Buno region becomes 13th to record a case of coronavirus as Ghana's COVID-19 case count shoots up to 3,091. President Akufuado and his cabinet will, over the next three days, commence a process of examining data so far got on the impact of COVID-19. Meanwhile, Cabinet is to meet over the next three days to access real impact of COVID-19 on the economy. On international front, flood kills 200 people in Kenya after heavy rains there. Uh, these stories, uh, plus uh, more, a lot more coming up over the hour, plus the very latest in business, sports and entertainment. Now, the Pediatric Emergency Unit of the Confarnochi Teaching Hospital has suspended health services to new cases. Meanwhile, inpatients are still receiving treatment. William Evans Inkum is joining us uh, on, on Skype with details. Uh, Evans, how are you? Uh, good afternoon and thanks very much uh, for your time. So, what can you report? Well, Stephen, I can report that it is not a good news for uh, parents or guardians who may be suffering and who need some level of emergency. Right, we apologize uh, for the we apologize uh, for the challenge. Uh, with uh, Evans Incomes Skype. We'll try and re-establish contact with him and continue with that narrative from where he left off. But right now, President Kufuado will later today lead a three-day cabinet retreat to scrutinize data uh, so far gathered by government on the impact of the deadly coronavirus outbreak across the governance sectors of Ghana. Uh, we'll, let's uh, first hear the information minister, Kojo Pongkrumah, make that announcement part of it. President Akufuado and his cabinet will over the next three days commence a process of examining data so far got on the impact of COVID-19 across the governance sectors in Ghana. It will be recalled that from the onset of the pandemic, the minister responsible for finance, the Honorable Ken Oforiata, briefed nation through parliament on the projected economic impact of the pandemic and measures that government was projecting to take at the time to mitigate impact. Since then, under the leadership of the president, the government of Ghana has rolled out a number of measures in responding first to the health crisis specifically, and second to the socio-economic challenges that with managing it. These measures, as you recall, include free water for three months, free electricity for three months, for land consumers, and 50% discount um, for non line consumers, among others. Um, there's also mention of a soft loan program, which we'll speak about shortly, and then um, the facilitation of other loan facilities, I think as was mentioned yesterday by the President of Jubilee, through some of the commercial banks. Now, about eight weeks into the pandemic here in Ghana, and as we get closer to mid-year, the government of Ghana has actual data on the real impact of COVID-19 across various sectors, education, health, uh, the economy, trade, um, the legal, several other areas. The president has instructed all ministers to report on the impact across their sectors and proffer recommendations for recovery. At a cabinet retreat that is starting later today and will go on for the next three days, the government of Ghana will examine the observed impact, the recommendations that have been made, the implications, and will commence preparations for laying same before Parliament during the mid-year um, review. That's just a quick update, and we're done with it, as we did the last time, depending on the outcome. We'll do well to share it um, with you.
Right, so we'll be going back to that story and uh, related COVID-19 case count, etc. But right now, let's go back to uh, William Evans in Kum, uh, from Kumasi, who was speaking to us about the pediatric emergency unit of uh, Fuanochi Teaching Hospital suspending services to new cases. He's uh, back on Skype now. So, Ms. Nkum, you were telling us exactly uh, what necessitated the uh, suspension of the services. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Right, uh, I think uh, today is about time with William Evans Incom. We usually get very crisp communication with him from Kumasi and his team. Uh, so, Ms. Enkum, can you hear me? Yes, I'm here, Mr. Great. So, I'm saying that you were earlier telling us what necessitated the suspension. Okay, I'm afraid we'll have to uh, leave uh, William Evans' income until such a time that we have a good connection to continue our conversation. But Ghana's COVID-19 case count has shot up to 3,091. The new figures come after uh, 372 new cases were recorded from various parts of the country. The Bunu region has also become the 13th to record a case of the virus. Let's listen to the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Patrick Kuma Abwaje, as he briefed the country on the new cases. As of the 4th of May this year, the total case count, as you have seen on the website, is 3,091 cases. Uh, of this figure, it's an increase of about 372 cases since the last updates and this as usual covers all is diagnosed since the first case was recorded out of this number a slight increase of those recovered has moved to about 303 cases and 18 deaths there has been no COVID-19 related death since the last aid uh, which was two days ago this number leads us with a case, uh, a total number of 2,770 um, active cases. When we say active cases, what does it mean? It means that the number of people that we are actually currently uh, following up, that is exclude those who have recovered and those who have died, and that gives us about 1,770. There are still a number of people who may have left the country, so there are lots to follow up and people who are also not being, who are not, uh, being reached. In terms of the case recorded since the last um, update, 248 had come from Greater Accra, and that came from 20 districts instead of the 24 districts that were recorded in the last update. We have mainly from Accra Metro, 48, Kualek Lote, 41, Ablikuma South, Ashaman, 17. Ashaman has come down now, and this comes as a 20 out of the 24 district that reported cases in the last update. The rest of the country contributed about 124 new cases, and I'll share the details in the course of this presentation. After the tell, uh, Case up to the, the 3,091 cases identified, 944 uh, has come from the routine surveillance. That is those presenting with symptoms at the various health facilities. At the last update, that number was 919. 2,032 have been identified through the enhanced contact tracing, and uh, as usual, the quarantine cases still adds up about 115. For the types of presentation and case management, we have about 2,765, accounting for about 9% of those cases presented with asymptomatic or they have some mild symptoms and most of them are being managed at our at home treatment centers and mainly at the isolation centers. Six hundred eighteen of this number had come from the Routine surveillance, and as, as much as 2,032 has come from the enhanced contact trade. 
The number of people who are moderately ill still remains at five, and that has not increased since the last um, update. When it comes to the positivity rate, we, still, we have a positivity rate, 38,069 persons have been tested from the routine surveillance, and we have 944, giving it a positivity rate of 2. 85 percent, the, the last presentation about 2.9 percent. And on 2,803 has come from the enhanced contact tracing. And out of the 2,032 mentioned earlier have been confirmed, leaving our positivity rate of about 1.98 percent. And the Director of Public Health at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Bedou Sarkodie, has been explaining the model adopted by uh, the Ghana Health Service in reporting of cases. Um, the graph that we see here is what we have plotted based on the data that we started picking for testing in the laboratory. The management of every outbreak, we have the mandate to plot what we call epidemic curve. Plotting epidemic curve, the best variable should have been the date sample was taken and you use the various daily case incidents to plot for cases confirmed COVID. This data, I will explain later why it's not really available. The proxy next to it is the date the patient was seen at the health facility. Again, there is a challenge and a bit of gap, and for that reason, it's not complete. The next test is the date sample was taken, and we have data for all the total number of cases confirmed positive, and also for the negative, and that is what we have plotted here for the positive cases. The model that Ghana took, it's difficult to get the date um, the person reported to facility and also the date sample, sample was taken because we are waiting for people to show signs and symptoms for the few cases that we had. Our approach is to immediately identify all the contacts of that individual and is waiting for the contacts to develop symptoms and signs. Immediately as we identify individual as a contact, we take samples from all the contacts and send to the lab to test to enable us to pick all the infected cases as early as possible, put them in isolation to make sure our communities are as safe as possible. Based on this, if we are wait for people to develop symptoms, probably it may be too late, we would have spread too far and the burden of positive cases that we have would have been much atrocious and higher than this that we see here. So I say that we have a gap with regards to the number of cases that, are, that um, have signs and symptoms. That is a rationale. And those also that reported to the facility a particular day, most of the people did not report to the facility. When you identify you as a contact, you come to the homes, place of work, and any reasonable place that you meet this person, take the sample there, and then send them for things. So they, most of them initially never reported to any facility before we identified them as being positive. So the best proxy for us as a country, which is um, very creditworthy, and a lot of countries are indeed calling to emulate how we are going as small country with such an achievement.
And now 49 persons, 49% uh, I beg your pardon of persons who have contracted COVID-19 in the Ashanti region are aged between 20 and 39. The Ashanti Regional Director of Health Services, Dr. Yamano Tinkrai, who made this known, uh, said most cases show no symptoms of infection. We're having interacting with some uh, youth in the region. Frankly speaking, I'm a bit scared since I fall between the age range you just mentioned. But the reality is that we have difficult people living in the Ashanti with regards to the youth. Uh, what I can say is that most of the youth are still engaging in gatherings. They meet to play football, they meet to play drat and other kind of games, which they must stop. So we have a huge problem in the region, but we are looking forward to keep this thing. As churned out by the health experts and the president, I am making sure I am able to go by the safety protocols. As you can see, I have my nose mask and I also have my sanitizer in my bag. So anything I do, like handling money, I, I use the sanitizer when there is no water around. But if I'm going to any office and I see the water and the soap there, I use it. Right, uh, let's cross over to William Evans Inkum in the Ashanti region, who uh, we have been trying to connect via Skype. It's back on uh, so we can have that conversation. Um, Zenkum, I know that there are two things we want to talk about. Uh, first, to talk about the situation with the suspension of services at the... Uh, right, I think William Evans Inkum. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Stephen. Good, good, good. So earlier, I wanted to ask you what necessitated the suspension of services to new cases, and you were giving us a narrative when we lost connection. Well, so um, on the 5th of uh, this month, two days ago, uh, a patient um, who was brought We well, apologize sincerely for the disruption in services to Ashanti region, but attendance to hospitals uh, for healthcare in the Ashanti region has dropped by 10% in the wake of COVID-19. A quarterly review by the Ashanti Regional Health Directorate showed services such as antenatal, child health, OPD, and family planning services have dropped also. Correspondent uh, Beatrice Spielgabra spoke with the uh, Regional Director of Health, Dr. Yumano Tinkrang, on the dangers of uh, continuous decline. Which areas specifically have you seen some reduction in attendance? Thank you. In fact, uh, unfortunately, we've seen a reduction in all our public health indicators. When we talk of public health indicators, we mean maternal health services, antenatal coverage, supervised delivery, postnatal coverages, family planning. We've seen close about 10 percentage drop in all these indicators. And what is worrying is the vaccine preventable diseases like uh, the polio, the BCG, the OPV, Penta 3 and other things. The challenge is that uh, these are so vital so important, it's life-saving. So we should look at it again. Uh, the issue is not that the health workers are not working or on concentrating on COVID-19, but the issue is that people are not coming for our services. And, and that is uh, worrying because uh, <laughs> if we are not careful, we may fight COVID-19, but it may also create problems for us in the near future. What at all is making people fear not to go to the hospitals to get these services? Yes, there's a lot that we need to investigate and then come out uh, with our findings. But for me, uh, the hypothesis is that uh, most probably people fear COVID-19 in hospitals, thinking that uh, COVID-19 is there. So maybe when they go to the hospital, they will get it. Or when they come into contact with healthcare workers, they will get it. Actually, a lot of people now maybe fear healthcare workers because they think that the healthcare worker uh, is maybe having COVID-19. They say with people who really get COVID-19 and then also go home, and people are running away from them. So I believe that it's part of the stigma that uh, this COVID-19 is also creating. It has, it, it, it has never happened that way. All the time you see us plateau, we call it plateau. Most of the indicators will plateau. 
But this time we realize that it's coming down. Not that uh, we are not providing services. All the services are there. But you realize that the service utilization has now become a major challenge. If we continue to see a decline from now to, let's say, end of the year. The effect will not be very good at all. Because you realize that uh, these routine services are so important as far as our public health is concerned. So we are going to compromise the public health of the whole country. Try and then have a very strong health system uh, so that the health system can sustain the economy. So the first focus is more on the public health. So we we'll have to do attack COVID-19 side by side with provision of services. And this is what we want, area that we want the media also to support us. Beaches Yogabra, TV3 News, Kumasi. Meanwhile, a member of the COVID-19 case management team, Dr. Lawrence Oforibuedu, says none of the healthcare workers managing COVID-19 cases at the front line has been infected by the virus. According to him, majority of healthcare personnel who contract the virus are those who do not work at the treatment center. Who are managing cases at the front line has been involved in infected. All the health workers we have been hearing are people who are actually healthcare workers, but not actually in the treatment center working. So that has been my motivation that, oh, indeed, people who expose themselves to be properly trained to manage confirmed cases are still working without any, any, any infection. But some of our colleagues who actually uh, are working in other facilities who may not have gone through the drill that we went through in preparing ourselves to manage in confirmed areas might have been exposed from other diverse areas. But we are still working on it because if one health worker gets infected, no matter where the person works, it's an indictment to the health um, care society. So we are working on it to improve the care. And the Ghana Medical Association is calling for a change in what it describes as the uh, Rambo style of picking persons presumed to have contracted coronavirus from their localities. According to the association, the scary nature of the process is the cause of the stigmatization of persons infected by the virus even after treatment. Stigmatization has been one of the challenges in the fight against the COVID-19 in the country. Persons presumed to have contracted the virus are picked up from their residence amid sirens with an ambulance or a fleet of vehicles. This process, the association says, has been identified as a cause of the fear and panic among citizens, hence stigmatizing recovered patients. Until such a time that we have educated the public to the extent that people know that corona is like a flu. You can get it, you recover, and you don't have the ability to give it to anybody else again. We must find a way of picking people discreetly without making a public show of it. Aside this, the association also wants government to prioritize the prompt release of test results of healthcare workers and inpatients while enhancing preventive measures. You have situations where there's an exposure on the ward, they have taken their sample, then the whole ward is closed down or the whole unit is closed down, they are not taking new patients and they are waiting for sample uh, results to come. And these go and join that backlog of community samples. That is definitely not right. Reacting to hints of a possible lifting of restrictions on social gatherings by government, the Deputy General Secretary wondered the basis for that decision. Has government convinced all of us in the community, in the scientific world, that the data suggests that they can lift that? Easing of some restrictions, everything should be backed by data and by the science. Now, if government has enough data to think that they want to do that. Like I mentioned, we must change the way we do things. And that is, we cannot wait and just announce it that we have done it. A virologist, Dr. Eugene Sebastian Arthur, cautioned against any plans by government to lift restrictions on social gatherings now. According to him, there must be a strict enhancement of efforts already put in place to contain the spread of the virus. Until we get to that stage where people are comfortable with wearing of masks, okay, and knowing how to properly use them, I don't think it is in the right direction to lift the, social, uh, the, the restriction on social distancing and all that. I think this 
methods come together. So social distancing, um, the wearing of masks with proper hand washing with soap and running water, these go together. Okay, so if you are going to lift social distancing, you have to make sure that wearing of mask and hand washing is properly done and is done by everybody so that they are comfortable in doing them. And Ghana's largest opposition party, the National Democratic Congress, NDC, has suspended Bernard Alote Jacobs, considered by some as a fire brand. The former Central Regional Chairman of the party was suspended for his persistent anti-party conduct. Alote Jacobs has been criticized by some members of the party for certain utterances in the, in the media recently, which many said uh, will hurt the fortunes of the party going into the 2020 elections. Let's engage Jonathan Asanchochere, lecturer at the University of Cape Coast, uh, political analyst, joining us. I'm sorry, uh, good afternoon. Thanks very much for your time. So, suspending Alote Jacobs, is it the right thing to do, considering uh, he has held such an important position as chairman of the party in, in the region? Well, good afternoon, Kevin, and good afternoon to your viewers. I think that um, there is something we call corporate damage and corporate benefit. Now, if the action, statement, and pronouncement of an individual really affect the corporate good, of an entity, I think that the only thing that, that that particular entity should do is to get rid of that particular individual. And so the decision that the party has taken, I think it is in the right direction. Mm. As far as they believe that the activities, the actions, pronouncement, statement on air, and whatever of Mr. Lutezer Corp is concerned, if, if, if you consider that, then obviously the party is in the right in mm. taking that particular decision. Mm. It is just an unfortunate thing that a misfortune has befallen somebody like that. And so we don't have to take glory in that. But if you look at the corporate interest and the corporate good of the, the, the party, I think that that decision is right. But, but Mr. Alote Jacobs hasn't exactly spoken untruths about the party. And uh, most of the comments he has made, uh, he has backed with reasoning. So there are some who might see this as trying to stifle free speech within the party, as uh, some analysts have made references to? Well, Stephen, um, it is often said that in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed person is the king. And then the, mm -hmm. the question is, what is that one-eyed person doing in the kingdom of the blind? So the, the fact is that you may have some reasons. He's not the only person to be able to do that. But if consistently your pronouncement tend to to undermine the progress, the forward-looking of the party, I think that the party has every decision to take mm. in, as far as that particular you know, issue is concerned. You see, let me, let me prefer my own wisdom. I think that I will advise Mr. Lucidico, if indeed he believes that the NBC has really benefited from that party, if he believes he's done so, if he knows very well, and he's acknowledged when, Mr. when Professor Mills was in power, you know, of the kind of benefit he's gotten from the party. So if indeed he feels that that is where he has it, if a corporate decision has been taken, I think he should try and abide by it. If I were him, I wouldn't go to Peace FM again. If I were him, I would stop going to Asempa FM and allow those who think they can communicate on the part and on behalf of the party to do so. People have suffered much more jeopardy for, for less things. For, for, for higher things, for example, if you, if you consider what happened to uh, the former secretary of the MPP, mm. uh, such a fine gentleman, yeah. the chairman, you know, they said that the activities were, were, were more or less that were in controversy of, of, of the progress of the party, and it and there was something that would not ensure their victory, so they were suspended. So, so, so your, your, your suggestion, so your suggestion it, to, your yeah. suggestion to Mr. Alote Jacobs is to personally make the decision to withdraw from all the yes. media appearances in order not just to save his face, but also to save the reputation and image of the party he represents? Thank you. That is all that it should be. If I were him, that is the decision I would take because he shouldn't forget that he has benefited right. from the party and if today the party thinks that his activities, his pronouncements, more or less, 
more or less ensuring that the party does not progress, but it progress, right. then we should think of the corporate interest and the corporate good of that entity. Right. And Maybe. say that irrespective of his personal relation that he has with Mr. Sefakai, he is withdrawing right. for uh, the interest of the party. And I Mr. think Asantiochiri. it should be a plus for him. We're grateful for your time. Thank you extremely. Uh, Jonathan Asantiochiri is a senior lecturer, political science lecturer at the University of Cape Coast. I'm Stephen Enti. This is still Midday Live from our studios at Adisawik. Right now, a day after an incident in Takrati killed a two-year-old uh, and destroyed thousands uh, of cities worth of properties, our reporter uh, there in the western region, Monica Dede Odonko, who has visited the family home of the deceased, is joining us uh, with some updates uh, from the western region. ...to prevent the general public from going there. This occurrence saw to the loss of properties as well as lives. A two-year-old boy by name Ohene Boachi Yadom out of this fire incident Yes, a two-year-old boy by name Boachi Yadom. This is the picture of the boy whose life was lost through this fire outbreak. We are currently at the family house to know what the family is doing pertaining the occurrence that happened yesterday. With me now is Justina Edu, who happens to be the auntie of this deceased. And um, she was the last person the boy was with yesterday before the incidents occurred. Justina, memoir cover. Yeah, major so I'm in a mini shop inside. Now I'm outside I'm Well, I apologize uh, for the poor connection there, but uh, we'll take a break here and when we return, we'll bring you the very latest in business. And later, uh, we'll see if we can reestablish contact with Western Region and bring you that update. Welcome to the business segment. Now, Chief Executive Officer of the National Board for Small Scale uh, Industries says businesses which will apply for the soft loans made available by government due to the effects of coronavirus will do so via the technology portal. Kosi Yanki Aye uh, was speaking at a media briefing on COVID-19 here in Accra. Over the past few weeks, the National Board for Small Scale Industries, in consultation with many of the industry leaders, the ministries, some government officials have met. As you are aware, there needs to be engagement with the rights holders, the financial institutions, to align with the direction of the president as well as the good people of Ghana. So in the past few weeks, we have led a few engagements to come up with a product and those products are aligned with what the people, the micro, small and medium enterprises need to be able to go through this very tough time. This has also been supported by the Ministry of Finance and his team, as well as the Board of National Board for Small Scale Industries, ensuring that at the end of the day, when this program is rolled out, everything goes on very efficiently and is transparent for us all to be able to access. With that, we've also come up, worked very closely with the various stakeholders to come up with the eligibility criteria and really tighten it in such a way that it allows for people to have the option and be able to apply for the facility. Exclusively, we've also been able to communicate to everyone, with certainly the associations, trade groups, and the financial institution so that they align so that when the program is rolled out we're able to support and assist in order to make this more efficient and transparent the team as well as the board decided to work on an, a technology portal where applications can be processed and where applications would go to 
We are also considering and with engagements that we've had in the past weeks to align very closely with those who might not have access to technology in some of the districts across the country so that we do not exclude anybody from assessing and to apply for the facility. So in the past few weeks we've been working on this portal at all to ensure that it is the right one for our board to approve as well as to make it more efficient. Currently we are stress testing the portal to ensure that on the day when it is launched, when there's a rush or when there are a lot of people, it does not disappoint any of us. And so currently, in the past few weeks, as I've mentioned, we've been working on coming up with a product to support the micro, small, and medium enterprises, not forgetting the informal, but also considering the fall as well. We've been working on the portal where the applications will come through to ensure that there's accessibility for the nation, not selected people, and it would also be transparent and efficient for us to be able to get our funding. And we believe that in the few once the stress test is done, we will continue in the coming weeks to engage with various stakeholders so that they can start educating the population and we'll start the communication as well so that more people know about it and can apply for it to avoid future uh, challenges where people are not able to hear much about what we have to offer. As on 2.1 billion cities in cash has so far been paid to depositors of the various savings and loans companies as well as those in the microcredit and savings and loans bracket whose funds were locked up due to the financial sector crisis. Information Minister Kojo Ponkroma giving details at the, press, at, the, at the Meet the Press series on COVID-19 said by the end of May 2020, the receiver would have settled all claims. Out of a total claims worth approximately 6.4 billion that was received at the close extended deadline for the submission of claims for these organizations, 347 microfinance companies, 39 microcredit companies, 23 savings and loans, and finance house companies. Legitimate claims admitted for processing and payment after validation in the region of 5.66 billion Ghana cities. The approximate 740 million is difference between the total claims received and the value of legitimate claims admitted for processing and payment was due largely to two main reasons. One, invalid claims which were rejected and two, set-offs and cross-lending, that is some depositors who had either taken loans from some of these same entities or had in their custody placements from some of these resolved companies. So when you net that off, in addition to those that were invalid, um, you will get a difference of 740 million. So what they have validated to pay is 5.66 billion Ghana cities. Now based on those validations the receiver official liquidator has commenced work on some 5.32 billion leaving an amount 340 million that is going through the very final uh, processes of uh, second level checks payments made to date depositor payments are made in form that is in cash and by way of zero coupon rated bonds to date, approximately 2.11 billion has been paid in cash, while about 2.95 billion has been paid in bond, bringing total payment to 5.06 billion. Now, based on total cash payments to be made by the end of the depositor pay exercise, it is expected that a population of individual depositors numbering about 297,000 whose claims have been validated and accepted in the resolution of the aforementioned groups of companies, and ultimately not less than 290,000, that's about 98% in number of individual claims, will be fully paid in cash. The remaining 2% of individual depositor claims will be paid by a combination of cash and bond. So here are the next steps on the payments. Um, they are first of all concluding the depositor payment process, and the key next steps to be undertaken are as follows. They want to conclude the final second level validation of 340 million and make payments accordingly. 
expect that by the end of May, they should be done with that. There are some of the organizations whose book records uh, ha still have challenges, and they are processing those for some further investigations. And freight forwarders at the Takrade port are picketing against emerging challenges with the implementation of the Unipass or Integrated Custom Systems at the port. We're joined on the telephone lines now uh, with a freight forwarder, uh, Kofi Mensah, for some uh, key questions on this. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mensah. We know that you had gathered at the port of uh, Takrade. I want to find out what is the purpose? All right. Good afternoon once again. I'm Koko Mensa, a fixed weather in Takradi. What is happening currently is that we, in fact, we did this uh, morning show to, to express our sadness about a new system that the government has rolled on board. The reason being that is that uh, when I know I have to think of sure if you want to implement any new thing, the new thing is supposed to be far better than the old one. But for now, we can see that the old one is better, very better than the new one because in processing your DOE, so your declaration in this system takes much longer time than the old system. The old system, we formally use like three minutes in issuing our declaration and we are free to go and pay our duty. This one, you put in your application, it takes like three weeks, two weeks, and then imported our crew charges and demolish at the port. For now, things are very hard and tough for us. Every day, you have to be chasing them up and down with your documents. The job that you need to do a day. We can't spend two weeks going to them. They said we are solving it, and then it will take two days. Let's say, for instance, last week I wanted to pay a duty. They said my document has expired, so I should go and see the system administrator. I went there, and then uh, the system has just solved it. After now, I'm not able to pay the duty. So I don't know the reason why this system has been bought. We are not against the system. But right now, we are saying that we have challenges in the system. They should go back to their drawing board and make sure that they solve all these challenges and bring it back to us to use. Because at the moment, we are struggling processing our documents. Yes, people's money are lying in our accounts. We can't pay duties. So this is our worry and this is our, our, our issue now. If the government can listen to us, let's continue with the duty and they'll go back to their drawing board and solve all the petty, petty challenges on it. Now, you can't hook to the EMDs. Now, certain line cannot have full, full access of the system. We are saying to and now we are using documents moving up and down. So we are expecting that if the government will listen to us, then by the DC and go and solve the new first problem and bring it back onto us. This is our challenge now. Right. Uh, Kofi Mensah is, uh, is a freight forwarder. This is still Midday Live from our studios at Adesawi Kanda in Accra. Up next is sports. Hi, good afternoon. It's time to do sports here on Midday Live on TV3. My name is Yao Ofosula. Now, former Ghana coach Kwasi Apia claims he has been disrespected by the Ghana Football Association as he cranks up in his bid to recover his unpaid salaries plus winning bonuses from the body. Apia lost his job as Black Stars coach after the GFA decided not to renew his contract, bringing an end to a two-year spell with the team. And it seems the dust from that divorce is yet to settle. Apia says he's owed five months of salary an outstanding bonus is total in 180,000 US dollars and wants the body to settle it as soon as possible. The GFA's documents on the legacy debts uh, they inherited from the Normalization Committee of the Ghana Football Association says APEA is owed that same amount and the breakdown says it includes four months salary of 35,000 uh, US dollars a month uh, that has worked up to 140,000 and two March bonuses totaling 40,000 US dollars from two games against South Africa in Cape Coast and Sao Tome away from home. Apia became Ghana boss for a second stint after the 2017 Africa Cup of Nations and headed into the 2019 tournament with a contractual mandate to win the tournament. The Black Stars exited the tournament at the second round stage despite enhanced financial emoluments, including doubled up winning bonuses before the new GFA uh, under Keto Kreku decided. They wanted a new direction with another former Black Stars captain, C.K. Akono, in charge. Well, let's do, some, let's do some more news. And when is the Ghana Premier League resuming? Now, that is the question that lingers on the minds of football fans and other stakeholders in the country. Now, the game has been suspended since the 16th of March and is at risk of getting cancelled if the situation with the coronavirus does not get any better. We tried getting some insights into the matter with the GFA, and here's the story. 
The Ghana Premier League will remain suspended for the time being as the Ghana Football Association awaits prompting from government to resume football. There has been no top flight football since March 16 due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic and with some major leagues being cancelled around the world, there is pressure from within the ranks of the local game to follow suit. The Ghana Premier League is not too keen to do the same. The handlers believe there is a big window before now and the end of the year to rethink when to safely restart the campaign. The communications director of the Ghana FA, Henry Asantichum, has admitted several clubs want the league cancelled but maintains it will depend on the word from the high office of the president of the country. It's one of the things that came up in our discussion. The, the president was blunt. He gave them a straightforward answer when the clubs started asking um, what we are doing about the league campaign. Some of the clubs felt or feel we should cancel the season. Others think we should hold on, wait for a while and take a decision. Now, um, you, you, you cannot take a decision in isolation. There have been a number of um, suggestions and advice that have come from different quarters, different people, medical practitioners. They think because of COVID, we cannot play football because it's a contact game. Currently, we are in limbo. Um, and I, I, I want to be blunt as possible. We are in limbo because we haven't completed a league season in Ghana for the past three years. So, so taking a decision to either suspend, truncate, abort, it's, 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 it's something that you need to think deeply about. Discussions have taken place between the GFA and the league clubs. And without setting decisions made, the GFA is pressing ahead with the original plan to keep the game under suspension until the ban on social gathering is lifted. Then, discussions will begin on the steps to take to bring back the game. Against Mohamed Al Hassan, he goes past Mohamed Al Hassan, would it be the first goal? Well, that's all the sports news this afternoon. And that's how we wrap up uh, with Midday Live from our studios at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. Thanks very much for staying with us. I'm Stephen Enti on behalf of the crew. Good afternoon. There is more news at 3news.com.